Ukraine, Kharkiv region, the village of Korotich, Kennel, Osman Guya, owners, Alexander and Alexandria Zubotny. 18th of March, 2022. The war on four paws. Sergei Valierovich Neboha, Cherkasy region, Ukraine. Kennel of Caucasian Shepherds, Lignum Vitae, the Tree of Life. On February 24, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine, bringing a huge amount of tears, trouble and grief. Cities are destroyed, people are dying, pets are dying, with their owners too. In every second Ukrainian family, almost there is an animal, it can be a dog or a cat, or it can be some kind of family farm or a family zoo. Our film will tell you about those animals who have died or suffered during the period of Russian aggression in Ukraine. My name is Sergei Valierovich Neboha. I am the owner of the breeding kennel of Caucasian Shepherd Dogs called the Tree of Life in Cherkasy, Ukraine. In this film, we have tried to collect some small testimonies of these crimes. tragedies and grief that took place from the first day of aggression and continue to take place until now. Unfortunately, we are not able to present the full terrible picture of these tragic stories, which came to Ukraine in the form of Russian peace. But a small part of it we can try to show and talk about. And in our case, this is about dogs. And this film will be devoted to all animals injured or killed in Ukraine. We were going to try to drive through all the liberated districts of the Kiev region. Unfortunately, many territories were mined and it was prohibited to go there. So we only managed to visit a few places. We tried to get in contact with suffering owners of the animal nurseries and breeding kennels that were unable to leave and continue to live under occupation. Some of them died and in some districts the nurseries and settlements were completely destroyed. During the time that we were driving throughout all the liberated territories of the Kiev region, there was not a single settlement where we did not encounter evidence of animal abuse. The animals were shot, they were eaten, or they were just tortured for fun. Many animals suffered or died during the shelling. 
The first nursery we tried to get to was based in the village of Zhereva, in the Ivan Kiv district, Kiev region. This is the world-famous kennel of Caucasian shepherd dogs called Daur Don. The owners are Tatyana Shetalova and Andrei Masyuk. These famous and award-winning sinologists are well known throughout the world. We wanted to visit them first. Why? Because there the dogs were without water and food for about 17 long days. So we wanted not only to film this story, but to help as well. We carried a whole trailer of humanitarian aid with us. We had frozen meat briquettes, some types of animal feed and canned food. Why do we do this? Because in each place that we managed to visit there were hungry mouths. Of course, we can't possibly cover the complete story of all of this impact. But in this short documentary, we have tried to collect small grains, drops in the ocean we call the Sea of Grief, brought down upon our country by Russian peace. The village of Zhereva, Ivankiv district, Kiev region, Ukraine. The kennel Dower Don. Owners Tatyana Shatalova and Andrei Masyuk. Finally, we have arrived at the village Zhereva. And now we are in the famous kennel Dower Don. These are the owners. Andrei Masyuk and Tatyana Shatalova who are well known on the exhibition and event circuit. The kennel Daur Don unfortunately received a lot of Russian gifts. Andrei, how long were you and your kennels occupied? Not for so long a time actually, but really it was very scary, very hard, and psychologically difficult and tough. You said that some of your dogs died. Yeah. Three of our dogs died from the bombing. They were killed by pieces of shrapnel. But thank God the rest of our dogs managed to survive. On February 24th, the war began. We left the kennels on March 14th. We left on March 14th. So we had stayed here for three weeks from when the invasion began. Yes, we didn't leave the kennels immediately. There was no food. We mean animal feed. We were going to buy feed and meat for dogs on the 24th of February. But the war started and that was it. We couldn't go anywhere because the next day we were occupied. All the bridges were blown up in the district. It was the end of March when your district was liberated. Yep, it was liberated on the 31st of March. Aha, I see. We left on March 14th. And only because our guys from the armed forces just said to us, get out of here because hell is coming. You shouldn't be here. We put dogs into our bus, as many as we could, 11 adults, 5 teenage puppies, 8 newborn puppies. They were born 4 days previous. And we left. Our assistant still wanted to remain and stay here. But the next day he and his brother were forced to leave too. Then the dogs were alone for 17 days without food, without water. It was terrible. We cried and prayed every day. Andrei, how did the dogs react to the explosions? Many of us know that even when firecrackers explode, some dogs can be okay, but others cannot. Even some humans don't react well to them sometimes. Well, of course, all the dogs endured psychological suffering. And many dogs are pups of war now. That's, it is what it is. You can't prevent it or avoid it. They're broken. Yes, when explosions were somewhere there, when it was shelling at a distance, they were all active. But when the shelling started here, 
closer to them. When our house began to shake, when the ground was trembling, it was really scary, even for me, not only the dogs. Yeah, the dogs of war. As of now, a third of all kennels in Ukraine have suffered. And unfortunately, some of them simply don't exist anymore. Hey, Russian dog lovers, these are your gifts to us, Ukrainian dog lovers. Thank you very much, colleagues. We will remember you. We will. Ukraine, Kyiv region, Irpen, the charity foundation Konora. Owner and volunteer, Andrei Dolzhenko. Hello, my name is Andrei Dolzhenko. I'm the head and the founder of the charity foundation Konora. Before the war started, I worked as an instructor trainer at the Universal Training Center Helion. We were engaged in animal training, both for sports and for domestication. We represented the pride and dignity of our country at international events, took part in world championships in the international competition of Ukraine. We were engaged in the training of assault dogs. We helped various organizations. During the first wave of war, everyone who had military experience, who could handle weapons, who served in the army, was called up into the army. I didn't have this experience, but I couldn't stand aside. I wanted to join the army too, but I wasn't allowed to go to the front line. So instead, I have dedicated all my time, all my resources, all my strength to help the animals and their owners who have suffered from Russian aggression. So, we created this charity foundation with the aim to help everyone who has suffered from Russian aggression from war. I want to say that I have been living in Irpen for three years and just before the war I moved. So before the war started I lived there. My friends were there, my house was there, there were the streets where I walked around, walked with dogs. After the invasion started we tried to make contact with many different people there. We were aware of what was going on, how our friends were hiding in basements, how they were afraid of bombing. They ran away from Irpen, across mine fields, sometimes the enemy captured them. We only had phone contact. We heard it all. And we just couldn't do anything, because the bridges were blown up. Nobody let us go there. There were intense battles. From the day our army forces pushed back the enemy out of Irpen, we went there to see what was going on. We were helping everyone who needed it and we became the witnesses to all the horror that had happened there. We saw animals that were killed by shelling. We saw animals that died because of stress and fear. We saw animals that died because they were left alone in their enclosures, tied by ropes or closed up in apartments. We saw animals that had to eat each other because they didn't have any food at all. I have a client, my friend, his name is Sergei. I helped to train the Kane Corso Mastiff. And he said that not far from him was a new litter of Kane Corso and French Bulldogs. It was in Bucha. He said that the dogs had been there for a month alone. I'm not ready to criticize the owners when you live under shelling from all sides. Look at the pictures from the European evacuation. Almost everyone carried their dogs and cats with them. But I suppose it is easier when you have just one husky there. You just take it and carry them out of there. Well, yes. But if you have 20 cani corsi, the situation is completely different. Big dogs and a large number of them? It is easier to say. Well, the first day we arrived back in Irpen, it was terrible because along the road to Zhitomir there were ruined and bombed buildings. Here and there houses were just destroyed. 
The entire road was covered with metal scraps, shattered glass, mangled wires. Asphalt was broken because of the tanks. The whole road was covered with a layer of grit. You drive and it crunches under the wheels. Burned military equipment and tanks. Shot up civilian cars. Corpses lying nearby. Nobody took them away and we noticed that they had lain there for many days. Because corpses were covered with dust and lay in puddles due to the rain. And we drove past them. It was like you entered into an apocalypse. There was no connection, no electricity, no water, no internet. You were cut off from the world. You arrived there and everything was ruined. Things lying everywhere. Some jackets there, some boots. And you don't even know if there's somebody's leg in that boot, if there is a hand in that jacket, or they are just left behind things. Our soldiers are all exhausted after the fighting. They reload weapons, they collect ammunition, and dogs were running here and there. It was so terrible. We saw eaten dogs too. I want people throughout the civilized world to take heed of what you hear. We should ask questions of ourselves. What questions should we ask Russian dog breeders and trainers? And how would they answer these questions? Kiev, Ukraine, the owner of Dog City and a Red Cross volunteer, Sander Ishchenko. Sandra Ishchenko is here with me. Sandra is one of the people who helped animals during the occupation. Well-known towns blighted by tragedy, Bucha and Hostomel. She helped there at that time. She is one of the people who personally helped animals and the owners of those animals. I noticed many people helped us. So many people, from just ordinary civilians to the older generation. Old women took care of many animals. Those that were lost or ran away or were just abandoned by owners. Some people just broke into flats. Even my close friends did that. To take the animals locked inside, to rescue them. Also, the authorities of the Expo Center of Ukraine in Kiev allowed us to take animals there for shelter. Almost all people were in the underground metro station shelters with their animals, from rabbits to big dogs. You mean our society responded to this situation that people should save their animals too? I'm very pleased to know it. Our strength is in such decisions as this. Yes, at least our government and governing bodies confirmed that people could take their animals to shelters. We saved animals with no obstacles at government level. Maybe we had not so much help from the government, but we had no obstacles. Even in embassies they had no objection and signed documents. They gave permission to carry animals west to Europe, and the Red Cross signed the documents to easily cross the borders with animals. I heard that this process of letting people's pets abroad with them was simplified. Yes, but it was for pets only, not for animals from nurseries or kennels. You could easily bring your pets out of the country with you, but the ones who were homeless, you couldn't. Once I had to submit a fake form that they were a refugee's dogs, as authorities didn't want to permit these particular dogs as transportation to Australia. Just for the animals' sake to save them, right? Right. We could save pets and we were helped. But the border customs officers of other countries didn't want animals from nurseries and kennels crossing. That's why we needed to write all the letters for them, show that these animals were being transported via a certain organization or with a certain person. I mean, you have to show that someone should take responsibility for them. Sandra, does the Red Cross help animals? Now, what can the directors of charity organizations do for animals when it comes to war in our country? Well, if you mean just animals, there is Ukraine Animals. They do lots of things themselves or may tell you which organization you can contact. They give many people my contact and for myself about them also. 
The Red Cross officially does not have in their statutes that they should care about helping animals, but in fact they do help a lot by their own initiative. They order food, they process animals along with their owners, who can be refugees or migrants, and they provide animals with food. They request that feed for animals should be included in humanitarian supplies and orders. Not only food, but medicine also, because animals need to be processed. Antiparasitics, flea medicine, diapers, various things like collars, carriers are in great need. People ran away, the collars were lost or torn off. So it was not possible to buy pet carriers or any boxes, we had to order them. Some people sent some to us, and we bought with the help of the Red Cross. It was easy to find, because people understood that I was not buying for myself, to keep somewhere only for me, but for charity. Therefore, people were eager to help. They understood that I was an official representative and really helped us. We know stories where volunteers were killed in this conflict. So how could you continue to do such work? Most volunteers are students, young people, people that couldn't ignore this tragedy. Were you afraid of it? You're a young woman. Of course I was afraid. I'm not absolutely insane. What drove you? I was driven by the need to help. Maybe that's the main foundation of our strength. Kiev, Ukraine. Akademistechko area. Guest house, Sotny. Owner, Alexander. An incredible event happened to us in the hotel where we were staying. The owner of our hotel was a man called Sasha. He walked around the hotel carrying a cat in his hands. And when he discovered that we were going to be shooting this documentary, he approached us and told us his story. On February 24th, we were in Irpen and heard the first shelling because we were not so far from Hostomel. But that morning had started for us not with shooting, but from our cat. She began to run around the flat. She jumped and sprang about, she ran here, she ran there. It was something quite strange. So this was the first sign something wasn't right. Then we heard the big explosions. So your animal felt it. It was 6 a.m. and animals feel everything immediately, like a barometer. Animals sense danger much faster than people. This is fact. This is the fact. 100% fact. On the second day of war, we witnessed serious shelling. So we decided to get out and go to our friend in Bobrinets. Because of the mass shelling, I told my daughter to pack things quickly. So, among all the things, she took only... Only a cat? Yeah. She took the cat. Feed for the cat, the cat's toilet tray, taking only a few of her own things. We arrived at our friend's house and they had an underground basement. We started to unpack our things and I asked my daughter, Hey, where are my things? She said, Dad, I thought you would take your things yourself. I've taken only Lisa's. Our cat's name is Lisa. We took everything for Lisa. The question of our other things, we would figure out. When the mass bombardment began, it was very hard for the first five to six days. We lived in the basement. I want to say that animals understand all danger. Our cat felt it deeply. She's usually very flitty, always running here and there, but at that time in the basement, she was quiet. She just sat on my hands all the time. She tried not to make any trouble for you. She felt everything. She didn't cause us any problems. But the most interesting thing started later. When on the seventh or eighth day of war, I said to my daughter, you should go abroad. You should go abroad and the cat will stay here with me. I was afraid that there could be problems on the border because of an animal. But my daughter said to me, no daddy, I will not leave my cat. So when she left with Lisa, my daughter told me that on the border with Romania, the border guard who checked them asked, I see you have a cat in your car. Yes, I do, she answered. My daughter thought that the Romanian guard wouldn't allow them through because she hadn't proper documents for Lisa. So my daughter was depressed. She didn't know what to do. But then the border guard came back with two packs of feed. 
Incredible. On the Romanian border, they brought feed for the cat and said to her, you can take it through. They gave it to her. You need it for your animal, they said. And another story. I have friends in Irpin. There was a situation where they didn't have the registration certificate for their car. They had been under shelling in Irpin until the middle of March. They wanted to reach Romanivka twice. To cross the border on foot, somehow. They couldn't be evacuated from there. They had two cats and one of them was very young and the other one a bit older. So they carry their cats in ordinary bags, among other things. For you to understand, it was about 12 kilometers to get the Romanivka on foot. So they went with these cats in bags for a long time. And in a day, they reached Kiev. They stayed at the railway station for another day, and then afterwards they traveled on to Lviv. From Lviv, they went on to Germany. And in Germany, one cat seemed to be fine, but the other one was sick. So, they brought that cat to the hospital in Germany and operated on it. Sadly, the cat died. When our defenders liberated Irpin from the Rashists, we went back there because we learned that our house had been bombed. When we arrived in Irpin, we saw terrible scenes, a horror picture show. We were stunned that so many domestic animals still remained in Irpin. We understood everyone who could have evacuated did so, and people who couldn't take animals with them just abandoned their pets to somehow give them a chance to survive. The most interesting thing is that animals are so smart. I saw such a situation where a big dog stayed near his house. I don't remember the dog breed. So we saw a car and the people wanted to help the dog and take it in their car. They gave it food, the dog ate it, but didn't want to go in the car. He just wanted to stay home, waiting for his master. Mikulichi village, Butcher district, Kiev region, Ukraine. Kennel, Celeste Regalo. Breeds, Italian Cana Corso Mastiff and Moscow Watchdog. Kennel, King's Guard. Oksana Marasova is a breeder of the Moscow Watchdog. Her story is quite different from others. This kennel didn't only suffer from occupation, there were also Russian tanks in the backyards. Exactly from her street, the Russians were launching their Grad rockets towards Kiev and Bucha. Exactly from her street. Also, the unfortunately infamous Kadyrovai, Chechen rebels, moved through their village to attack Kiev. We are in the village Mikolici in the Bucha district, correct? Right, this is the Bucha district. My name is Oksana Marasova. I live here with my dogs. I'm keeping and breeding here my Moscow watchdogs and Kani Corsi. We survived a terrible occupation from the first day till the last. There, 50 meters away, they came and stayed. They had three trenches and their weapons were pointed to my yard, right there. They told us if dogs barked, they would shoot them. That's all. We were warned about it from the first day. When there was no electricity, gas, heating, They saw our old house, saw smoke from our chimney, and three of them came to our place and told us they needed their soldiers to warm up in our house. I explained that this was impossible. We had eight adult dogs in the house. Plus, we have dogs around the perimeter. They told us that we had a choice. Either we take out the dogs to the outdoor enclosures or they would shoot them all because they needed their soldiers warmed up. Such pleasant liberators. I said to them, hey guys, for the sake of God, I have Moscow watchdogs. I brought in this breed of dogs here. A Russian breed from Moscow. I like them and I would like to raise their profile here. But nobody cared. 
I had to lie that my dogs had a lot of fleas because I didn't have time to treat for fleas. And only this finally stopped them. They said to us, maybe we should shoot them so you don't suffer because of your dogs and your dogs don't suffer because of fleas. But I begged them not to touch my dogs and they agreed. We had problems with water because nowadays everyone is connected to the same system for plumbing. That's why there was no water in the wells because we hadn't used them. We had only three wells across the street. There wasn't enough water. I gave water to my dogs every three days. Of course, it was too little. And porridge. Well, I couldn't even call their feed porridge. We had corn, but I had to mince it in a meat grinder. Because a dog's organism can't digest this product, even boiled corn. I minced it all on a Soviet meat grinder. But later, thank God, the orcs moved away. One of our neighbors had a generator. So he switched it on, and we were lucky to mince two buckets of wheat and two buckets of corn. Somehow I shared out the flour. But of course, it was nothing for 12 dogs. These four buckets were just a joke for the dogs. Every dog got four spoons once a day or sometimes twice a day. Each time the orcs said to us if the dogs barked, they would shoot them. They did it with horses, but it wasn't our village where they shot up the stables. So yeah, they shot all the horses, but it was in the Makarov district. Yeah, even yesterday when we drove, we saw Dobermans along the road. There are a lot of big dogs. If it was a little dog, you could pet it or you could give it something to eat. But big dogs frighten people. Yeah, people are afraid of them. So big dogs were doomed to die from the bullet, or from starvation, or from a tick bite. Dogs came to my place. The ones left by owners because they didn't know what else to do. Any bus that was able to evacuate people from here didn't take animals. People had to leave their animals. We fed cats here, we fed dogs, as many as we could. If someone slaughtered a hen, they knew I had a lot of dogs and someone brought a head of a hen, someone some chicken feet. So we boiled a bouillon for porridge with those heads and feet. And so I boiled porridge. But I also had corn. It wasn't minced, but I had it. I cooked it and I gave it to the dogs that were here and to the dogs that came to us to eat. Also, we drove out along the streets and fed all the other dogs. Here, on the field, they shot dogs and then we buried them. Orcs also took dogs with them. I asked them, what do you need dogs for? Nobody could understand it and it was hard to take that. Where have you come from? What do you need here? What do you want to liberate here? Us from our property? They robbed every house. Absolutely all houses were searched. They took all cans from the basements, things like that. We were faced with one story where a dog was cleaved like a pig and then was eaten. Owners explained that such affronts to civilized behavior were suffered in each second yard. The village of Zahalci, Bucha district, Kiev region, Ukraine. Sergei, an owner of murdered dogs. We are in the village of Zahalci. This is in the Bucha district, not far from Borodyanka. Here is one more dog lover who will tell his story, which of course is almost uncomprehending. Soroja, please tell us in a few words. We came here after the Russians were kicked out. My neighbor who lives next to my garden, she was here all the time. So she said that these orcs lived here in my house. There was a tank crew in a tank in my yard. Here, my gates were turned inside out. Now I've repaired them, and the tank crew lived where my kitchen was. We started to look for our dogs, but we couldn't find them. What kind of breeds did you have? One German Shepherd, a young one, and a small Jack Russell Terrier. We were looking for them. There were a lot of dogs, but we hadn't found ours. So we searched and searched. We had a little basement on the backyard, and there we had found a blanket. The head of the dog and its skin were wrapped in it. Your dog, our dog. He was tied to a stick. He was parted like a rabbit. The dog was skinned together with the head. The paws were cut separately. We buried him at the end of our garden. Our Jack Russell was shot. We also buried him in the garden. 
It's one thing to hear the first part of this story somewhere else, but another that you buried your own pet. My wife cried for a long time. I've heard similar things among many neighbors. Animals were killed, some animals died there, a lot of them. A lot of animals died. So they spared neither people nor dogs, I suppose. Well, my wife had a friend, she breeds shepherds. So she had two females and a male. So the orcs came and shot the females immediately. The male was injured. We had to operate on him. I understand. I understand. Thank you that you agreed to share this with us. Thank you. Vorzel, Ukraine, armyinform.com.ua. Correspondent, Sergei Mesura. These, these are dog paws. One from this house. The door was broken to pieces. They hanged the dogs by screws. I don't know what to call them. They screwed at least two dogs to this stepladder. They skinned and cut up the dogs here and dumped the guts here and there in another bag. They hacked up the dogs here and ate them. They left screwed paws and they ate dogs. What kind of subhumans are you Russians? It makes no sense. Two dogs were eaten. I don't understand. Is it because of hunger or is this the manner to kill, to hack and to dominate? I have no answer to this question. Call of a Russian soldier. Interception. Soldiers of Russian Federation eat dogs. Source. Security Service of Ukraine. Do you have anything to eat? Yeah, the day before yesterday we killed an alibi. Who? An alibi? Do you eat dogs? Well, yeah. I was hungry. So don't you have anything else to eat? We have dry rations, but I'm sick and tired of it. I wanted meat. Oh God, fuck our so-called army. We have killed all hens and geese. Oh, fuck. Don't worry. It's okay. A lot of animals were left behind on the first day of occupation and in the early days of the war. I ask you not to judge and not to condemn all people whom, because of different reasons, couldn't take their pets with them. We shouldn't condemn and judge, as you don't know what you would do in the same situation. But I have to admit that directly here in Ukraine, in our country, I've seen so many examples where people left expensive cars, property, money, gold, but they carried their pets. I bow in deep respect to all animal lovers. If it was a cat or if it was a dog. My sincere respect to all those people that couldn't leave their pets behind. The village of Kakhali, Borodyanka district, Kiev region, Ukraine. Volunteer and sinologist Alexander Sluhey. That's our girl. Our Caucasian shepherd dog survived the Russian occupation. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Sluhey. In many circles, I'm a colleague, a sinologist, a volunteer. So, okay, I live in Kiev. My grandmother lives here. This is the village of Kakhali in the Borodyanka district. How many days had you lived under occupation? How long were the Russians here? Not for long. Not for a long time. About a month? We had managed to leave a day before the Russians came into the village. My grandmother and my Caucasian shepherd dog stayed here. Some people also stayed here with their dogs and cats. Who took care of them? Food, water, various people. When the Russians were here, nobody had focused on that kind of thing. Nobody could bring food here. Nobody could take care. We had no possibility. We just couldn't go outdoors. I imagine that people felt very sick and tired here under occupation. Uh, we had no need to go far for that. Here, the Russians had headquarters in my neighbor's place. My neighbors were driven down into their own basement and the Russians were staying above them. 
I see. Dogs, cats, dogs and cats ran. Many animals were killed. A fellow villager called Ruslan lived two doors down here. He had an alibi. He left. But the dog stayed in its enclosure. Ruslan left food and water. And the neighbors did also, I guess. Yep. When they had the chance, they fed the dog. Ruslan returned, but the dog was dead. There are a lot of such stories. In our village, you can walk around and knock on every door and they would tell you. In such circumstances, we helped if we could. I mean, breeders and myself. I had spare food for dogs. I knew people had dogs in Zahalsi, in Dubinsi and in my village. So, I shared my dog's food. The same feedback I had from people from nearby villages that took care of dogs. Hey, hey, do you have food? Can we help? Do you have enough? We know where to get some. People shared what they could. Yeah. And the same situation was about treatment. Yesterday we came back from the Ivankiv district. Dobermans ran on the road. We encountered a Rottweiler. Yeah. They were abandoned, most likely. Yeah, I have one story about Rottweilers. Maybe your viewers will know something. Maybe someone will have some information. Luda Panova is a breeder of Rottweilers. She had a house in Zahalsi, but was injured with shrapnel. She was taken to Radomishl by ambulance. Basically, her dogs were left without their owner. The first day when I came there, it was the 5th or 6th of March. I saw those dogs and I posted online. Please, help me find the owner. Luda called me the same evening, crying, Sasha, where are my dogs? Help me find them. A day after, I returned to Zahalsi, but there were no dogs. Is that the breeder which came out of the hospital in Zaporizhia? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, she was injured. I talked to her yesterday. All her animals in her kennels were dead. Two dogs were stolen. Something like that. They were stolen more likely, all right. You know, I can take heart from this story that luckily the breeder is still alive. We also had a breeder in Dubinsi. Her name is Elena Rumianseva. She was the breeder of Rottweilers too. But she also had alibis. The breeder had cancer, unfortunately, and she had no possibility to feed her dogs during the invasion. Our sinologists, our friends, our acquaintances, those who could, they helped if they could. Yeah, a boy under shelling brought food from Stivizhenka. We grinded corn in bags and gave it to puppies. One dog was pregnant. We had a training school arrest in the Borodyanka district. A famous one. Yeah, people there were very friendly and when I asked, they reacted immediately. They had a whip round what they could. Someone gave money, someone treatment, someone dog food. So I brought all of it here, handed it out, made photos and video reports. Thank you, you helped us. The same situation was with the Sino Center Antius in Mezhihiria, the former residence of Yanukovych. Aha! Who could help, helped. We have also an organization called Ayopeo. That's been helping me recently. Yeah, it was quite calm in our yard till then. Until the tanks came. Yeah, the orcs stayed at the end of the street. They stayed and stayed and then they started to go away. They climbed in their tank and began to ruin every yard. So they drove in, made shit of the place and drove out. And so on. How did the pets, nurseries and breeders survive? Well, in different ways. The war brought people together. Breeders, dog owners, dog lovers, armateurs. There was no competition between us. Dog lovers were separated. I mean, 
Russian and Ukrainian dog lovers. Unfortunately, Russian dog lovers gloated about the fact that we were bombed and how our dogs died. Collecting such stories, we Sinologists of Ukraine shouldn't be silent. We should talk about it. The whole world has to know about it. We should share this information and repost it online as much as we can, you see, how everything is going on. Unfortunately, not all owners and breeders agreed to grant me an interview. It so happened not because they didn't want to tell their stories, but for many people the reason was inner trauma. Serious tragedies inside themselves from which they would take a long time to recover from. The village of Gorenka, Bucha district, Kiev region, Ukraine. Volunteer, Olga. Please introduce yourself. Who are you and where are you from? My name is Olga. I am from the village of Gorenka in the Bucha district, Kiev region. Gorenka, yes, yeah. I know the place. I'm a volunteer. I help animals. If we have the chance, my friend and I search for dogs, cats, anybody who needs help. Everyone who has been left behind. We help them to treat, to find a house. Luckily, the orcs didn't stop in our village. But three kilometers from us is the village Moshun. So it was under occupation and many animals suffered. How do they torture them? They shot everything that moved. And it wasn't always a deadly shot. Cats were shot in the spines to paralyze the back legs of the animals. Also we had situations when we took animals away from here. And they were in a terrible state. There were injuries not only from shelling, but from gunshots, grad missile shelling. Also, there were a lot of situations where the orcs shot cattle. Cows were shot not for food, but for fun. Just for fun or for what, I don't know. If there were mini farms or pigsties, they just threw there something with fuel. I mean some bottles with gas or petrol to burn everything together with the cattle. In a little private farm, some kind of cows were kept for meat, cows that were imported from Great Britain. This was such a big breed, almost without necks and red colored. So they were all shot at once. Never mind if it was a pregnant cow or not, bulls were also shot. There also was a big farm, so it was completely burned. Dogs were just shot in the yard. The orcs just came in and shot. Dogs even had no time to bark. First of all, men and dogs were shot. Then they shot farms, houses or farmhouses. But they didn't just shoot, they also burned them. It started on the 24th of February when all those orcs came into the village. Everyone was taken outside to line up. They shot all men from 15 and older. Mm -hmm. Women had 40 minutes to get away or they would be shot too. Then they shot the animals. Chickens tried to run away. Especially crudely, they shot dogs and cats. Dogs were loud, they cried, whined. Well, so they paid more attention to them. And farms were burned. They shot animals and then burned them all. So many animals. I can't say there were such atrocities committed by orcs like in Bucha or Irpin. But they tore animals apart. Cut and ate them. I don't know what kind of sages they have to be to do such things. 
I don't want to swear, but I can't find the right word. All this shit they did to animals. The kennels called Sirius were in the same district. There was a checkpoint on the way to the kennels. They didn't allow anyone to go through. But several times they allowed our worker to bring aid and food for animals to the kennel. But then they didn't allow you to go there at all. There were over 3,000 dogs. It was a miracle they survived. Dogs were fed on porridge and acorns. There were 3,000 dogs in the Sirius kennels and all of them survived. But in Borodyanka, there were 450 dogs in a kennel. Borodyanka is the municipal enterprise. This is from Kiev. Borodyanka had suffered so much. There were only 150 or 170 dogs that survived. The rest of the dogs died because nobody could get there. We tried. So many people tried. We had a situation where when people were shot. There were a few people that wanted to get there with food, but they were shot. And volunteers were shot at point-blank range, or they didn't allow you to drive, or sometimes when they saw we came to the dogs, they allowed us to come closer, and then... They just coldly shot people. They shot more than coldly. They mocked people and did what they wanted. They shot dogs, not at point-blank range because of volunteers. The orcs wanted animals to suffer, and then they killed them. They knew volunteers wanted to provide humanitarian aid for animals. Young guys. It was terrible. I know, Olga. Thanks to all the guys because they tried to get there, to save the animals they could. A lot of animals were in shock because they were wounded. And because of the explosions, it was so loud. And despite of it all, many animals were lucky to survive. You know, we were also looking for lost animals because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They ran away and it was hard to catch them. Volunteers and people that got there, they caught animals and handed them over to others. And the animals were handed on to people not only on the territory of Ukraine, but also abroad. I have to say that we had great help from abroad. Because our volunteers and volunteers from abroad cooperated. Yeah, we had it. It was an incredible demand. We had a lot of animals that wanted to eat. You couldn't just cook porridge or carry pots with yourself. We needed feed for animals to sprinkle it. And thank God they came through and delivered until now. So we can still feed animals. Luckily we have feed. Thank you all for your film. That you can tell the truth. People should know it. Our four-legged pets suffer much more than people. We should help them. They are victims of war. How many people don't talk about it? How many animals died? Hundreds of thousands. Thank you, Olga. Thank you so much. Thanks. Butcher, Kiev region, Ukraine. Kennel, Wolfhound. Owners, Tatiana and Vladimir Kopachevi. Hi, hi, hey there. Hi. Good dog, good boy. Is this a lady, am I right? This is his mum. There were three tanks near my window, my private tanks as I call them. And they fired from here into Irpin. Well, of course they bombarded here too. But not as much as it was at the beginning for Bucha. How many dogs did you have when they came here? Eleven dogs. Eleven dogs? Under occupation, I went to them and fed them every day. I had also 50 pigeons there, so I climbed up on the dovecot too. The last two days before liberation, I found out there was a sniper on the opposite side and he saw me every day. Can you imagine how he didn't shoot me? I don't know. Of course, I wore a terrible dress, I wore a torn jacket that had been burnt on the grill and torn trousers. I had grey hair because of smoke from the grill. Thank God nobody touched me. How many people were killed here? How many neighbors? A lot, I have to say. My own daughter died. The elder one was shot. She shouted glory to Ukraine at the last moment. Was she shot here? In Bucha. In Yablonka Street. We had a shop there. She was going home with two friends. 
So the orcs asked them to empty their pockets, and of course, her friends, these guys, they had knives. So they were shot. All three were put in a pit. We were waiting for a month and a half before we could exhume them. The authorities had to conduct an examination. I was waiting for a month and a half. It was only after Easter when we could lay her to rest properly. You're on Voxalna Street. Is this the street where the orcs shot civilians? Well, they were shot in the early days when the orcs occupied us. I stayed and counted tanks. There were 20 of them. This was a column. Yeah, and 16 armored vehicles. There were a lot of weapons on top of them. There were automatic rifles, machine guns, something like that. I counted them. They came to the school. Our defenders met them there, as I understood. In general, legs and hands were strewn about the yards, somewhere a half of a head sat. I'm sorry, but somewhere penises and cocks, they lay separated. So, some orcs met their end well. So, when our guys had to withdraw from here, then we were under occupation for about 40 days. You can't even imagine. Every day we heard shots. Every day I heard how they go to the toilet, because they were in our neighbor's yard. I heard how they ate, how they fired a volley, one shot and then everything started. They could shoot for the whole day or they could shoot for 15 minutes. When I heard spoons tapping, I knew they were eating. So I ran to feed my dogs and returned back. So I watched. Someone came in, shot for a while and went back. On the last day, orcs had positions for the whole day, near or close to the enclosures. They shot the whole day without any pauses. The last two days, I came out early in the morning, and it was silent. It was strange, I came out and nobody was here. For three days, they shot non-stop, and at about 4 or 5 a.m., they just got away from here. For two days, we belonged to nobody. Neither our defenders came in, nor Russians were here. Everything was on edge. On the third day, our soldiers arrived back, and from that time, it's been calm around here, more or less. How were the dogs' reactions to the shooting? Anyone would go crazy. We had five female dogs. They were about five months old. No one went crazy. Everything is okay. Usually when the orcs shot, dogs hid in the doghouse. I had one adult male dog, Bura. He came from Kazakhstan. He was a very expensive dog. I mean, there's no such breed in Ukraine. Frankly though, this dog went completely mental. The village of Dernovka, Brovary district, Kiev region, Ukraine. Kennel, the planet of dogs. Pavlo Lichensky, co-owner, Svetlana Lyschenska. Everything started very unexpectedly. Just like 1941. A treacherous attack by invaders at 4 a.m. Early in the morning we found out about it. But we didn't take money from our cards. All products were sold out in the first few hours after the invasion. We had enough feed for small dogs, of course, but we had two alibis and a Caucasian shepherd dog as well. What to give them? The bridge was blown up and we had no way to get to the shops. So we went to the next town, Berezan. There you could buy a loaf of bread, two packs of noodles, a bag of flour per person. Well, we thought we could dilute the bread with water and add in there an egg. Luckily we had eggs. We could add loaves of white bread, we could cook noodles. So we survived on that for quite some time. Of course we couldn't plan ahead. We had feed that day and thank God for that. Yeah, here are our villages. These are all well known. Peromoha. Everybody knows Rudnitska. Rudnitska, Lukianivka. Yeah, Lukianivka. And also there's... Is this the Brovary district? Yeah. When the evacuation was announced, our village Dernovka somehow wasn't included. I thought all villages were evacuated and ours was just forgotten. If you wanted to evacuate, you could join. We decided we don't go. 
They announced it at 9 o'clock and at 12 you should be on the bus. How could we do it with our dogs? It was impossible with dogs. Such a decision was made by many dog lovers, sinologists, because it was impossible to transport a kennel and just move somewhere. It was very hard. I know a lot of people decided to stay. In Luki and Ivka, the owners of a Caucasian shepherd kennel also didn't move. But it was really hard shelling when they liberated. An Iskander missile hit Barashivka. Peremoha, Lukyanivka and Urudnitska were all seriously destroyed. These were very close villages and we had heard everything. We had been under occupation and we survived the occupation. It wasn't such a terrible situation here like in Bucha. But at the same time we had four tanks and armored vehicles of invaders here. But now they don't want to talk about it. Two of them came into our village. One man was killed. Two were injured while our territorial defense forces cleaned out the orcs from the village. For about 20 to 30 minutes all we heard was this shelling and then it became quiet. We were hiding in the basement. You couldn't go far from your yard. Of course, we needed enclosures or cages, but we didn't have a lot of cages. So we took animals in our hands, some in cages, and we all went down into the basement. And we needed our animals to behave very quietly. Tell me, how had Russian judges perceived our misfortune? It was unexpected rhetoric for me. For me, it was the unexpected answers when I asked, do you understand why you need war with us? What is the reason? But they answered, it's not war. They explained it simply like this. Your president is a clown. He hasn't listened to ours, the clever one. So until the time he doesn't listen to ours, we will teach you. Teach means kill. Yes. And the second version of this discussion? Well, you didn't care when children were killed. I won't say who killed who. It's, it's just a point in Donetsk. And now you become nervous. I said, okay, we won't discuss who killed who. But to your mind, children from Kiev, Bucha, Irpin, Chernihiv deserve to be the answer for someone's dead children from the last eight years? And children from Mariupol, Kharkiv, for whom now? These are all Russian-speaking regions. Yes, eight years ago in Donetsk, you can look at photos of Donetsk that had been bombed for eight years and look at the photos of Chernihiv. Chernihiv, Sumy, Kharkiv, Okhtyrka, Mariupol, Okhtyrka, Volnovaha, Volnovaha, Mariupol. All of these cities that were bombed for eight days at that moment. Just compare. But they answered, we don't give a damn about you. Ours will come and they will figure it out with you. Mm, such things dog lovers say to dog lovers. And again, these are dog lovers who were here in Ukraine many times and earned a lot of money here. A lot of awards and money. They earned a lot of money selling puppies here. We let them stay in our house. They lived as relatives. Unfortunately, they don't listen to us. Nah, they don't listen. They posted photos of their powdered dogs on pillows. Their fluffed up dogs from exhibitions. Everybody should be happy because they got another title. I tell them, you don't understand. Our dogs are yours. I mean, the dogs of your breeding. They are here. They're not just hungry. They are cold, hungry, dirty, and they sit with us in the basement. Sveta, how many dogs were killed or shot? They shot the entire kennels. They came into our country and ate dogs. And we refused to eat to save our pets. This is the national difference between Ukrainians and Russians. That is the difference. I talked yesterday with dog lovers and they said to us, here is humanitarian aid for people and here is aid for dogs. And first of all, we went for humanitarian aid for our dogs. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. 100%. Sveta, that is the difference between us and them. We take care of our dogs more than we take care of ourselves.
We're going now to the Chernihiv region. We're taking about 200 kilograms of beef, noses, trimmings, ears, in general, dry food. Chernihiv, Ukraine. Kennel, Wolfie, of Caucasian Shepherds. Owner, Vyacheslav Zakatov. 26th of June, 2022. Yeah, yeah. Chernihiv yeah, was under yeah, siege. That's it. Everybody yeah. knew it. The city wasn't taken, but it was seriously under siege. It was under siege. But they began firing at us. On the third day of war, there was a direct hit of the enclosure. Three enclosures were broken. Three dogs were killed and two dogs were injured. Were they adult dogs? Yeah, right? adult dogs. Sure. I buried them. I took out the shrapnel from two injured dogs and they survived. I hid throughout the whole siege. I was there in the house. I didn't go anywhere. Well, we saw, friends, and we couldn't show everything. But the village, the district of the town where we are, there are a lot of bombed out houses, a lot of bombed enterprise units, a lot of burned houses. Here we are at your place. I don't see any intact window. No, there are no windows now. Behind our back, the shrapnel went through and all frames were cut and glass smashed through. I'll try to explain how it was. In a square of 150 meters around this house, for the duration of military action, for three months. Yep, I got 10 explosions here. Two houses over there were untouched, but my house got hit. I say it again, dogs were killed. But I stayed here all the time because I couldn't go anywhere else. I lived here all the whole time with my dogs. We hadn't had water, gas, electricity for three months. Only a week or two ago we got gas, water and everything we needed. Windows were broken from the first hit. 19 windows. Even in the basement windows were broken. And what else happened? So, which type of joy I had in my heart to stay alive? On the fourth day of war, my pregnant dog whelped a litter. Like with a small child, I petted, I played and took care of the puppies. This was like a spark of life for me throughout all this. You had the sense to continue to do something, yeah? Yes. You know what? About puppies. I know stories in Chernihiv and Sumy. There was Dmitry Zakutelov, whose females were whelping. So I talked to him on the phone. I heard shelling in the background, and he continued to help his dogs whelp. There were a lot of these situations. I had the same. I managed to prevent one dog from being pregnant, so not to have pups. But behind my back, the other dog got pregnant and whelped anyway. I called such puppies the kids of war. This dog who was born, He's three months. So he was malnourished in the first month and was very small. About four kilograms. There wasn't any milk to feed him on. From two to 29 shells fired during each day. There and in return. How did the dogs take it? The dogs were calm. They somehow understood the situation. They were silent and quiet. Nobody even barked. Our house was shaking, the earth was shaking, but they were silent. There was a lot of shrapnel near the enclosures, 
This place where we're sitting now, three square meters, I found 56 pieces of bomb shrapnel. They hit the house, not taking into account the windows. They had gone through our village and fired. If we put together all those impacts, so there would be about 70. When the shell hit here, it was 30 meters from the house. Two shells fell in the garden. There was a blast wave from the shell over the roofs. Well, everything was broken here. It's a miracle it didn't catch fire. They fired, you flew out of it if burning or not. Like a roulette wheel. Hit or miss. The main thing is we survived. Most of the animals were saved. I would like to thank you for your visit and that you brought feed. Thank you for your support. And now we should just stay alive and not just stay alive, but stake our victory. Best regards from Chernihiv. Glory to Ukraine. Together to victory. Glory to the heroes. Please, stop killing. Ukraine, Kyiv region, Irpin. The charity foundation Konura. Owner and volunteer, Andriy Dolzhenko. Dear friends, I would like to address everyone who lives in Ukraine and also to everyone who lives abroad. Our dogs and other animals that live in Ukraine these days need your help. They can't call on a phone and ask for help. They can't post on Facebook. They just quietly suffer. They were left. They were betrayed. And they were left without the possibility to exist. So, if you have the chance to take a purebred dog or a dog without a breed, or many of your friends can pass it on to you, or maybe you can see an animal running on the street, this is the best moment to help at least one creature. If you have dreamed about having a pet for a long time, this is the best moment to take one. Help animals, and together we will reach our victory. Thank you. This film is dedicated to all the murdered and suffering animals from Russian aggression. To all murdered volunteers and people who took part in the rescue of animals. Such as Leonid Maximov, Anastasia Elanskaya, Anatoly Berezhnoy, Pasha Lee, and many, many others. Light a candle of memory for all volunteers, breeders, who saved animals, risking their lives. Volunteers who were killed during rescues were young Ukrainians. They showed with their deeds the whole world a real example of humanity and compassion. Everlasting memory to the dead and deep respect to the injured, crippled breeders and volunteers. These are the pinnacle of the progressive youth of Ukraine. The whole world should know about them. This is their feat of humanity and it shouldn't be forgotten. Russia is an aggressor country, a terrorist country. It must be punished for these acts of inhumanity. These crimes of medieval savagery which take place in Ukraine every day. In this film we tried, in a palatable way, to show the horrible situation that befell our animals in Ukraine. Unfortunately, we can't show the true extent of the tragedies taking place in our country. Animals, dogs, can't ask people for help. 
мы в свою очередь we can't show the number of killed and suffering animals, but the number is in the multiples of thousands. These are kennels, nurseries, zoos, farms, eco-parks, and just the domestic pets, which were part of almost every Ukrainian family. We were also unable to name the huge number of dogs that were eaten, torn to pieces just for fun, shot and tortured. The number of killed dogs during shelling and fighting that were and are on the occupied territories is in the thousands. The whole world should know about these tragedies. These are shocking for the entire civilized world. The expression, dogs are out of politics, created by Russian propaganda in the 21st century in Ukraine, has lost its relevance, proven by epic failure, like all slogans created by Russian propaganda. Sinology has always been, is and will be in politics. And in current Russian reality, it is part of politics. All of us, the whole world, has to understand if they continue to allow participation of Russian Sinologists in International Canine Federation events, as well as livestock sales from Russia. So it is obviously paying for the bombs which are dropped on the heads of Ukrainian people. Behind every dog that is sold from Russia, our tears, tragedies, massacres of Ukrainian citizens and animals approved by you, enabled by you, with your acquiescence. I want to give a huge thanks to everyone involved in the making of this film. The aim of this film is to convey to the world community and show all citizens of our civilized world the absolute horror of the situation in Ukraine. We used footage of Kyiv, Chernihiv, Kharkiv and Sumy regions in the film. Thank you all. The war on four paws. A film by Sergei Neboha. Written and directed by Sergei Naboha. Director of photography, Mohamed Mohamedov. Sound designer and editor, Elena Goronovic. Composer, Sergei Goronovic. Special thanks to Mohamed Mohamedov for the help in making this film.